is fuel for your body, your mind, and definitely your sport. But let's face it, nutrition is confusing and the expectations on girls and women to be thin and have a six pack are exhausting. If you've ever been frustrated with your body, confused about nutrition, obsessed with eating healthy or guilty when you don't, under ate, over ate, or overtrained, and overwhelmed with all the pressure, then this podcast is for you. Nutrition can be easy, you can take control of it, but it might start with letting go of control by asking for help and making a change. I'm Lindsay Elizabeth Cortez, sports dietitian and owner of Rise Up Nutrition, where I empower female athletes to overcome nutrition concerns and perform at their highest level, to stop being confused by all the mixed or harmful messages, and finally have confidence in your body as a fierce, fit, and fueled female athlete. Hello, fans. Lindsay Elizabeth Cortez here, your host, and I'm here with a wonderful guest, Pippa Wolven. She is a middle distance runner from England who has run for Great Britain in cross country and steeplechase for over a decade. She started university life in Birmingham, England, before taking up a scholarship at Florida State University in the U.S., where her experience with Red S began. After struggling with a condition for the years that followed, Pippa finally found the medical, nutritional, and psychological support she needed to overcome it. After returning to her sport with a healthy mindset and a menstrual cycle, Pippa started mentoring others to help them avoid the same pitfalls. Since doing so, she has been shocked at her sheer magnitude of the issues across all sports, genders, and age groups, and took her mentoring to the next level by studying a master's in positive psychology and behavior change coaching. Shortly after the COVID-19 lockdowns, she was given an opportunity to establish Project Red S, a collaborative initiative aimed at raising awareness of the condition and signposting athletes, coaches, and parents to the right support and resources. And I'm grateful to Pippa personally because she reached out to me and you know now has myself and Rise Up Nutrition as a resource on her website for for this initiative. So Pippa, welcome to the to the podcast. Thank you so much. Great to be here. <laughs> Absolutely. So I kind of, you know, I think we'll get into your background and stuff like that. But I, I'd first just like to highlight Project Red S and have you tell us a bit more. As I said in your bio, it's coming from a personal place for you. But, you know, can you tell our listeners, you know, what is Project Red S and what is your, your goal of, of having this initiative? Yeah. Okay. So Project Red S, as you explained, is a collaborative initiative. It's run by myself and a couple of other, a doctor, my husband, and a couple of other athletes who are really passionate about trying to do something about this enormous problem that is just pervading the culture of sport right now. And we recognized that there's some brilliant medical research out there. And there's some awesome specialists like yourself in the nutrition department, and some medical experts that have qualified as endocrinologists with specialties in Red S and also psychologists who are really clued up about this and can help an athlete recover. And so we decided that we would help people find them because at the moment there seems to be a sort of scattered array of information on the internet and there's not really one sole collaborative resource that brings everything together. So we we decided to make one and um, it also involves just creating a community where athletes can share their experiences and connect with others going through the same thing. And also for their parents and partners and teammates, and even their coaches who might be struggling to help an athlete overcome something like this. Absolutely. Yeah, it's wonderful. And so you have resources, like I'm based in the US, you're in the UK. Do you have resources that are, you know, global? uh, Or is that your intention? Yes. So the idea is that we start in the UK where I'm based and the US where a couple of our other athletes are based and just get to know the specialists who have a real sound understanding of these issues. Because as I'm sure you're aware, there um, is an array of nutritionists and they all serve different needs. And this is quite a particular need and it, it has to be done right. So we want to make sure that we're connecting with the right people. And so we're going to build hopefully fairly quickly, but really in intensely across the world. And we're just in talks with people in Germany at the moment and um, hopefully other countries in Europe who are willing to help support a project like this and also be involved as a resource. 
Yeah, it's interesting even like for me, I I do consider myself somebody who is specializing in this, but then I, you know, I do things, I'm based in the US and I do help people virtually across the country and I do have some international clients, but it's one of those things where every once in a while somebody, you know, wants somebody local or in person or they need a local doctor, you Mm -hmm. know, and it's like, I even struggle to find people, you know, to outsource to. Mm. I really, there's not that many people that really do specialize in this. And it's, so it's a combination too. It's like, even within nutrition, okay, this is something that athletes struggle with. So you want a sports dietitian, but I can't say that all sports dietitians get this. And then doctors, you can have a a sports medicine physician. Those are hard to find even, um, unless you're linked up to a local university or something. And, and I think it's really difficult to diagnose red S as well. And so that's why not, it's just really hard to find somebody who has that kind of clear, like understanding of this condition. So I think that as you continue to build out these resources, I, I, it's even going to help me, you know, to know how, who to point people to. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. And that's exactly the idea is that often people who do specialize in this from a medical standpoint and professional standpoint, struggle to find a dietitian or a psychologist who can support them and vice versa. So I think it's amazing that in this day and age, we're able to have appointments virtually. And typically I try and find people who are able to do that because as you say, it's incredibly hard to find the right support resources. And if somebody in London needs to seek your support, then they can. And that's, that's really, really cool thing to be able to say. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because I can't tell you how many times my clients, it's like, I'm grateful that they found me and they're getting the right help from me, but then they need to go to the doctor and get blood work done or something. And like, then the doctor is contradicting, Mm. you know, something I've said or the plan I'm on and the doctor's saying, Oh, we're just going to put you on the pill or, Oh, your blood work is fine. And it's like, Nope. And then, you know, my clients have to come back to me and I have to like deescalate the situation and get them, you know, to trust in what I'm saying instead. And so it's going to be really helpful, not just for the athlete suffering, but I think for the professionals, like you said, to help doctors find dietitians, dietitians find psychologists, all that stuff. It's really good. Now you also talked about like the, the community aspect. Is that something that you know, is currently in place or, or kind of just the goal of like, you know, building a community or where people can interact with each other and be supported. Yeah, it's very much the goal. So we're still um, in our infancy. We started this in November. And um, I think first and foremost, we were focused on building the support resources because yes. as somebody who struggled with this, I know how isolating it can be if you just don't know who to turn to. And so they're on there. And then hopefully we're going to be able to create a forum where athletes can talk to other athletes and recommend certain people and just voice how they're feeling about this because it can be really lonely and just hard to get your head around. I'm sure you can relate to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that would be really great. And that's why we wanted to have you on this podcast soon, because I know how hard it is to start something. If somebody started their own business, it's like you started in November, let's get the word out. So you get that interest and get the traction and get the SEO going on Google. And then it'll be easier for you to build up these things and, you know, get people to sign up and join or whatever it is they need. So I really hope that um, as we continue this conversation, anybody is resonating with Red S or needing help with Red S that they will look into Project Red S and start following there. Thank you so much. Yeah. And it's it's so important for us to be able to build this community because it it is something that other athletes can help with. And um, it's not always about the professionals. It's about that one-to-one athlete to athlete support. And as an athlete yourself, I'm sure you can um, provide that too, which is really quite a brilliant combination. And it's not just females and it's not just runners. It's a whole host of individuals from a wide range of sports and backgrounds. Yes. I'm so glad you brought that up because I will say in my, in my current business, I am focusing on the female athlete. This is the female athlete nutrition podcast, but red S absolutely affects men as well and people of all, of all genders. So it's not something specific to females. And I think that's, it's, it's something that kind of always breaks my heart too. And I do have that, that male athlete come to me and they're looking for help. And I do on occasion work with male athletes one-on-one just on the side, but they don't have the same like 
group support that my female athletes have with me and my programming. And so I hope that that's something with Project Red S too, that really those those men struggling, those male athletes can get the help they need as well. So just hit me, Pippa. I've been talking about Project Red S this whole time and we never really <laughs> described what Red S is, although I do feel I talk about it enough on this podcast. And I have an entire episode, I believe it's episode number three, way back in the beginning where my, my episode was, what is Red S? But so um, I'll just briefly share with our listeners, it's called relative energy deficiency in sport. And it's when your body is not, you know, getting enough energy available to support your internal bodily humanly functions, as well as the energy you need to compete in sport. And the reason it gets so tricky with high level athletes is that when you're training day in and day out, your body sort of prioritizes sport because, you know, if you're out running around the track or you're on the court, like you're gonna, your body's going to figure out a way to survive through that practice or through that run or through that, whatever it might be. But at what consequence other things start to suffer, you know, it can be little unnoticeable things of like, Oh, I'm just feeling tired, fatigued, or like, I'm really sore. And then it's like, my hair is falling out. And then it's like, I'm irritable and cranky. And then it's like, I've totally lost my period. I have, you know, no feel good hormones, no endorphins. Oh my gosh, now my I'm having stress fractures and injured so that it can continue, right? So I would encourage our listeners to, to go back to episode number three, what is Red S? And also on, on my website and on the Project Red S website to learn more about it. But Pippa, let's let's hear about your experience with it. At what point in your in your athletic career did you start to struggle, which might be different than when you recognize that you had Red S? Mm, exactly. Yeah. Um, so if I go back to the beginning, I started running when I was around 12 years a- of age. I enjoyed a wide range of different sports. And it was only when I was about 17 that I decided to focus solely on running. And slowly my success built. And I was lucky enough to be offered a scholarship over um, in America to Florida State University. And I had been studying in the UK first. So I'd had a gradual increase in training volume. And thank Thankfully, I had a great support system around me. So I was able to match that with sufficient nutrient intake and this healthy life balance that can be quite elusive for a university student. But I was managing it okay. And it was time, I think, for my athletics career to take the next step. So off I went over to America. And of course, with that came this decrease in my support system because suddenly I was thousands of miles away from home and with a different coach who didn't know me and know the way that my mind and body had worked. And I had to sort of build these new relationships. And so after my first term, I started to realize I was becoming quite preoccupied with food and my body weight. And this was quite novel for me because I'd always been a huge eater and I didn't really care about what I looked like. It was always, how am I feeling? how am I performing? So it was a noticeable shift in my mindset and my attitude. But I I thought this was pretty normal. I thought that all elite athletes have to be super dedicated and focused and possibly quite restrictive in terms of what they chose to eat, and extremely committed to their training schedule. So instead of listening to my body and my mind, I suppose, as well, I just stuck to my training schedule like glue and never took a rest day if it wasn't on the plan and um, often pushed through some level of fatigue in training when, you know, I knew that it wasn't the right thing to do, but I didn't know better. And I had this image of what an elite athlete looked like. And I just... All I cared about was achieving that at all costs. So I didn't really notice when my mood started to become disrupted and I was a bit irritable and moody and, you know, that's to be expected sometimes, but it was pretty constant. And then I noticed some anemia that showed up in my blood tests. And that was the first sign that something was potentially wrong. And unfortunately, that was treated in isolation. So instead of looking into the root cause of, hey, why is my iron level low? Or why is this athlete's iron level low? It was treated with iron infusions to just boost those levels, which of course had a temporary effect in my fatigue uh, levels. I became slightly more energized, but because I wasn't fueling sufficiently, that didn't last very long. And so in answer to your question, when I when did I first start experiencing Red S, it was probably at age 
19, a couple of terms into my, my Florida State experience. And when I started to really suffer from it was a couple of terms later, by which point I had really wound down this spiral into a really unhealthy place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you highlighted a a lot of really great points. The first being because I, I do talk a lot to about disordered eating and eating disorders. And very often that can be a part of Red S, but sometimes it's not at all. But it's like your story really highlights the unintentional path that suddenly underfueling and being you know, a little obsessive about food and body for sure happened. It was very unintentional for you. You lost your support system and you were trying to be a great athlete, mm. you know, and in trying to be a great athlete and holding this idea or image in our head of what that looks like or the dedication that it takes, we started training too much under recovering, eating slightly less, and that imbalance is all it takes you know, to, to really start spiraling, like you said. Mm. So another great point that you had is like the anemia and how that was treated in isolation. You know, again, not to say it was wrong to get iron infusions because if your iron was low, you, you got to do that. But it is that deeper question of what's the root problem? You know, what's the bigger picture? And I see that a lot. I actually just started with a new client yesterday and it was, you know, day one, session one. And she was kind of asking me about her her GI health because she's having GI troubles too. And it's like, she was like, should I be eating, taking supplements or probiotics? And I'm like, well, I, you know, understanding everything that I do about your situation right now, like we can't, we just need to continue on the path of treating the underfueling first. Mm. And I was like, let's revisit this in six weeks and see how your GI system is doing then. But if we're treating the underfueling, nine times out of 10, the GI issues will resolve. If you're treating the underfueling, nine times out of 10, the anemia might, whether or not resolve, you might still need transfusions or supplementation in the process, but like, it's not going to be an ongoing problem, you know? Sure. Yeah. And I think so often these subtle underlying, well, these subtle surface level issues get, you know, the, the root cause of them is overlooked because you think, oh, hey, I can throw medication at this. And another challenge is that sometimes it takes some time for this energy balance to catch up with these issues. So, you know, as as you know, it takes time to rebuild your iron stores. And even if you have started fueling well again, you just need to be a little bit more patient about that level coming back up. And it's probably the same with GI issues too. Yeah, for sure. So how about you as a runner? I mean, you're a great runner. You've had many notable, you know, races and stuff. I've got this list in front of me. You were ninth at the 2012 World Junior Champions Championships in Steeplechase. You've just, you've had, you know, a great running career. And so when you started to spiral down with Red S, how did that affect you and your actual performances in running? Mm. Well, as is often the case with an initial um, reduction in energy, it came with some weight loss. And this was totally unsustainable and really quite unhealthy for me. But it had the short term effect of making me run slightly faster. And it's not something I would ever advocate for anybody for short term performance gain. But for me, it did have this initial performance boost. And I you know, ran fast. But this is not to say I couldn't have run even faster if I had fueled sufficiently this whole time. And so sadly, sorry to cut you off. But I just I love that I want to have that honest discussion about it. Because so many people are like, but I got faster when I lost weight. And it's like, okay, we don't have to deny it. You did for a certain period of time. But the, the problem is it's not sustainable. And so it comes to an end. And then what? And what if we just allowed ourselves, like you said, like maybe if I just fueled and took care of myself, I still would have run, had great performances, but I'll never know right now, you know? Yes. And and the hardest thing was that by the time you have got it into your head that you need to be lighter to be faster, and that has been proven in inverted commas because you ran faster for a short period of time, it then becomes really difficult to start believing that you could be capable of running any quicker at a heavier weight, which is, I think, what act, is what acts as a huge barrier to people for seeking support because they're terrified that their performance will suffer when, in fact, it only goes goes up once you start feeling better. Mm-hmm. 
And we'll, we'll only continue to go down if you stay on that path, right? Like you said, it is, it is a short term performance improvement. And so you can't recommend it because like, for what, you know, it, it's just so short term and then it will, it will continue to decline. So did you, did you see that in yourself that things just kind of continue to, to go downhill for you? Yep. I think the first step towards this downhill spiral was that I kept facing these little hurdles. So I would kept getting repeated upper respiratory infections and small niggles that I had never suffered with before. And then this level of fatigue just became greater and greater until I could no longer train to my full capacity. And also I wasn't recovering. So a huge part of training, as we know, is recovery. And I think as athletes, we can all be guilty of underestimating the value of that. And I for sure thought that more was more. And if I could just do as much as everyone else or more than they were, I would reap the rewards. And sadly, it didn't work out that way. So that was the first big barrier. And then the fatigue got so strong that I just couldn't train at all. And it really took me by surprise. But looking back now with everything I know, I can see that it was an obvious decline. But to an athlete who doesn't know anything about this, it can be so shocking and so hard to imagine that it's all due to a simple imbalance in energy. Hey fans, I hope you are enjoying this conversation so far and we'll be back to it in just a moment. But first, I want to pause and let you know that this episode is brought to you by the Female Athlete System of Transformation, aka the fast track to overcome disordered eating and use food as fuel to perform at your highest level. The Female Athlete System of Transformation is my unique program and proven systems to guide female athletes to understanding and implementing the proper nutrition for their sport, life, and health. Myself and my team of registered sports dietitians work one-on-one with clients to address their unique needs and counsel them through the nutritional and behavioral changes needed. Many female athletes who resonate with disordered eating, mental guilt around food and body, relative energy deficiency in sport or female athlete triad, amenorrhea, repeat injuries due to negligent nutrition, or frankly, just a lack of knowledge and understanding on their fueling needs have seen incredible success in the fast track. After years of working as a sports RD, I've compiled the most effective ways for female athletes to learn nutrition, be supported, be challenged, and ultimately find their success with fueling as fast as possible. So don't wait another day. Get to your goals faster by joining the Female Athlete System of Transformation. Look in the show notes or head to the website to book a free call and learn more. Okay, now let's get you back to the conversation. Enjoy. So at what point you recognize things were going downhill, when did you learn about Red S or maybe put that title to what your symptoms you were having? Mm, Good question. So the term Red S was only introduced in 2014 by the International Olympic Committee. And this was around the time I was struggling with these experiences. And so the only diagnosis I could relate to in any capacity was the female athlete triad, except that I didn't identify with an eating disorder because I thought that this was just normal behavior for someone at my level. And since so many of my behaviors were normalized in the setting that I was in, it was very hard for me to take a step back and realize how disordered I really was. And then with the period, which is another component of the female athlete triad, by this point, I had been advised to take the contraceptive pill to, in inverted commas, protect my bone density, which of course we know doesn't actually do that. And um, again, I didn't identify with that component of the triad. And then finally, I didn't really know what my bone density levels were because um, that information wasn't accessible to me. And so it took me a long time to understand that this was something more than the female athlete triad. And then I had to search for answers. So I took to the internet I was very much alone in this process. And thankfully, I came across a blog written by another athlete who had a very similar experience to my own. And she referred to this new term, Red S. And I could not believe how much I could identify with every single sign and symptom. It was totally overwhelming. And I just remember this awesome sense of relief that I had found 
the answer to what was wrong with me. And instead of, you know, being devastated that I had this condition that was really quite dangerous and debilitating, I was just relieved that I had found a name for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, again, sometimes I'm in my little bubble because this is what I do and what I focus on. But when you think about it, it's the year 2022. So it's, it's literally only been seven years of really having this title, this diagnosis of red ass, this term even coined. Mm -hmm. And it took quite some years. Like I really do think, I don't know about over in the UK, I think there's been some notable athletes in the UK who have talked about it, but I know here in the States, like it was kind of in 2019 when Mary Kane came out with her New York Times article and feature talking about red S that I think the term became at least in the athletic world more understood. I mean, but you're right. It was 2014 when in the medical journals, we gave it a name mm. 2019 in the U S it, it started getting some recognition because of some athletes speaking out on it. So we're still in such this infancy phase. And, and like I said, sometimes I'm in a bubble because I'm like, we started this podcast. I'm just like red ass, red ass, assuming everybody knows what it is. And it's so much in its infancy. And, and sure. I love, I love, well, I don't love it. It's tragic Pippa, but just how like female athlete tribe was not something that resonated with you. You didn't know your bone density. You didn't have an eating disorder in the, the classical clinical diagnosis way. And we had birth control to mask our menstrual cycle issues. So it's totally not something that resonated with you. I mean, it was still probably what was going on underlying. And this is why I do, I do often use the term disordered eating way more than eating disorders. And it's not because what you were describing of like the unintentional started not eating enough, that's disordered eating, mm -hmm. just whether you know it or not. You know, you just didn't know it, but it is, but it's normalized in sport, which is the problem. Yeah, totally. And I, to this day, don't think I've ever met particularly a female athlete who hasn't had or has some level of disordered eating. And I think that is such a testament to how normalized these behaviors are within sports culture. And, and that has to change. I completely agree with you. And it's funny, I'm just, I keep sharing about my business because it, as I was starting my business, I was trying to figure out like, okay, I'm not like, I do want to help athletes with eating disorders, but it's not that. Mm -hmm. And the term red S, I started my business before the term red S was super well known. And also not, not everybody knows they have red S, mm -hmm. you know, just because you're not performing well and are moody, you might not know that you have red S. So I didn't want to say like my business. So I was trying to figure out this middle ground of how do I explain to people what I do? And that's why I personally settled on the like helping athletes overcome disordered eating because and I, I still, to this day, sometimes question myself. I'm like, do people resonate with that? But but I do think that most female athletes and, and a lot of women just in general have some level of disordered eating behaviors or thoughts at some point in their life. And so, yeah, I don't know. It's just interesting because I, for you to also say like you've every athlete, it's sad, isn't it? Yeah, totally. And it's the reality. And I wish we could put a number on it because it would be so powerful if we could say 98% of women in this world have some level of disordered eating. And, you know, what is normal, really? I don't think anybody can define that, but there is certainly an abnormal and a lot of us have been there. Yes. It is hard to define normal too, because it's an individual experience, right? Like, you know, I'm just trying to think of an example. Skipping breakfast to me sounds disordered, but if somebody else is perfectly healthy physically and perfectly happy mentally not eating breakfast, then is it disordered? Okay, maybe it's not, you know? <laughs> so it's like, it's super to, to, to define what normal eating is. It's such an individualized, personalized thing. And then we have this clinically diagnosed eating disorder, but what's everywhere in between where our, our eating behaviors are not matching up with our, our physical health needs, our eating behaviors are not matching up with our mental health needs. And in that messy mix is like, well, it's, it's disordered if it's disordered to you somehow. Yeah. And I think it's, it's the most disordered when it comes from a place of 
this false belief system that we have to look a certain way or we have to weigh a certain amount or to eat a certain way. And it's it's such a shame that these messages are so prevalent and you can find them everywhere. And I suppose our job as you, the dietitian, and me, the advocate on the athlete side of things, is just to try and counteract these messages and show that it's it's not the way you have to do things. And so since I've made a return to running in a much more balanced way I think my main motivation is just to show that you can do this another way and it doesn't have to be disordered I am with you I might be the dietitian but I want to be the advocate too I'm always (laughs) like you know my personally running is a little different because of the whole pregnancy thing that just happened but like right prior to that I mean I was you know I'm not competing at a high level anymore at this stage in my life and nor was I ever at the level you were to be 100% transparent but like my best performances were post-college when I was appropriately fueled and happy with my fueling and eating, you know, being excited to carb load and embracing all the fats and like, you know, even allowing myself to, hey, post-race, you know, you want to have like, you know, fast food because it's on the way home. Like when I was allowing that freedom in my diet and I was fully fueled, I was running my best and feeling my best. And so it is possible and and you're an advocate for that and you're showing that too. So to backtrack, Pippa, what did your process, because here you are now, you are recovered, you're back to sport and you're advocating for being a fully fueled athlete. What did your recovery process look like, especially since there weren't many resources? You found that one athlete online who you were like, oh my God, I resonate with you. How did you go about seeking help when there was there were so little resources to help you at this time. Mm. Yeah, well, so after finding this blog online, I took to the internet and I researched every side of this condition. And um, I pretty soon became quite clued up on exactly what it is, which was helpful in some ways, maybe a little bit obsessive in others, because suddenly I was challenging all my energy and time into studying this. And it, and it can be overwhelming. But I could not find a medical expert who could help me. And because nobody was talking about it, especially um, in the circles, I was back in the UK by then and nobody in my club setup had ever heard of Red S or anybody that could help with it. And the same as my friends and family, like none of us knew about this. So it took me several months to find a medical doctor who had any level of understanding about this. And in that time, I had been going back and forth to my regular practitioner, and even an endocrinologist, and none of them had a grasp on it. And actually, they kept prescribing me dangerous things like the contraceptive pill, which I had come off in order to try and see whether my period would return, now knowing what I did about Red S. And so it was really quite a difficult process. And I suppose this my own experience has sparked my motivation to create an easier method of finding the support resources for others. But in answer to your question about how long it took to recover, so there was a real difference between finding these experts and learning what I needed to do and then actually implementing what I needed to do without the support of anybody close to me or a mentor or someone else who had been through it. Because I don't know about you, but when you're told by a middle-aged, non-sporty person that you have to change your entire lifestyle overnight, it's really daunting. And I hadn't met anybody who had done that successfully and returned to a high level of sport again, or in fact, any level of sport. And I'd heard about athletes who had become burnt out or overtrained and or had eating disorders and just had to walk away from the sport that they'd loved and worked so hard for. And I wasn't prepared to do that. And so I resisted the taking action part of recovery for a long while whilst I fought these mental battles in my head about, do I want to commit to this or can I do this on my own in my own way? But eventually I decided I was going to take some time off. I was going to dedicate myself to this. And I did. And the reward definitely took some time to catch up because by that point I had been in a deficit for so long that it took some real work to repay it. And eventually it did. And I would never, ever swap that recovery experience for anything because what I gained from it was so much greater than what I ever gained from um, high level sport. And what was that? What did you gain? 
Can you sort of summarize that for our listeners? Yeah, I suppose in one word, it would just be freedom. By that point, I had lived my life by so many rules for so long in the sport world and also in the the eating world. And although I was only really restrictive in my eating behaviors for a couple of years, before that, I was always so dedicated to my sport to a point where I, I didn't know who I was without it. And stepping away from it helped me realize that I was so much more than just a a sports person. And I had so much more in my life to be grateful for. And so dedicating time to figuring out what that was and how I could enjoy it to the same extent that I had enjoyed pushing myself and running was just the most life affirming experience. And, you know, now I will never put running before other things that matter to me if, if the time isn't right to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think just as you mentioned, you started learning about it, started seeking help, but to take the action and to make the changes was still difficult. And that's why it's so refreshing to have people like you share your story, come on this podcast and and just say like, but it's worth it. Take the action. Life is better. You gain so much more. It's always, I th- I don't think I've ever met anybody who said it isn't worth it. Yeah. Except for the people who are still in the middle of it and still, you know, still it's like, no, keep going forward. It will be worth it. You know, there's certainly that, that sticky middle ground of I'm trying to make these changes and it's really hard mentally and it's really hard. My life feels upside down. It's really hard physically. Yeah. Even you're still, if you're in that point where you're like, this does not seem worth it, you're still in the middle of it and keep moving forward. Totally. I 100% echo that. And there were so many times when I thought that I was recovered and because I had reached, you know, a healthy weight and actually my mind was so far from recovered and I, I had to figure all this out by myself. I mean, I didn't have a podcast. I didn't have a web resource to fall back on or, or mentor. And so I found it really hard to believe that I am. Um, I had to keep going because I had come so far already. But yeah, you have to go all the way. Otherwise, you're just stuck in this awful middle ground that is really even worse than the uh, the side effects of the issue. Yeah, that middle ground is is tricky. And I don't know <laughs> between if there's a, a UK, US or maybe age gap thing, but the song Jimmy Eat World in the middle is just replaying in my head right now. Everybody will have to go look it up after this. But the, it's like, it just takes some time. Little girl, you're in the middle. It's going to take time. And that's the song just looping in my head right now. It just, you're in the middle and you got to get to the other side and everything will be okay. Totally. Yeah. It's a good pump up song too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use that in my next warm up or something. But yeah, <laughs> it's just, it, I remember being so shocked so frequently about how much effort you have to put into this, but I can't tell you how worth the, it is for the reward. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, um, you know, I will do some shameless self promoting here if you're okay with that. Definitely. <laughs> That it is so, it, obviously you did it. You struggle, you, you figured it out on your own and you did that and that's awesome. But for everybody listening, you don't have to figure it out on your own anymore. So whether it be going, to, you know, to Project Red S website, Pippa's initiative and learning more, one day joining her community or joining my community, having me and my, my associate Jenna, our lead nutrition success coach, coach as your coaches, We also do group calls once a week. I have a group chat going with other female athletes that are in our programming. You are not alone and you can have help and you can have a community and it, and it's easier with other people. It's easier with help. It's easier with resources. Exactly. And that is such a gift to be able to fall back on that. And uh, I just wish that I had. And of course, I've learned a lot along the way, but I would have been significantly quicker if I had had your level of support. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you're back to running. Yes. What does that look like for you now? Because you, you did, you're back to running amazing and you're being an advocate of I can run well while being fueled and recovered. But as you also said, like, you have so much more freedom. So you're back to running with this freedom of life and knowing that that I am so much more 
than this. And there's so much more to my life. But yeah, what does running look like for you now? Like, what are you kind of regularly engaging in or having goals for? What does that look like? Mm, Well, I don't really look long term anymore. I used to set these big goals for myself. And whether it was an Olympics or a PB that season, I would really just fixate on this long term goal. And now I just go with the flow. And if I want to enter a half marathon or a fun run 5k, then I'll just enter it. And it could be a couple of months or just even a few weeks in advance. And I will enjoy the process of building towards that. And actually, a couple of years ago, it must have been about four years ago, when I first started getting my period back, I wasn't sure if I wanted to return to high level sport because I had learned so much about my body and my mind. And I was uncertain as to whether I could ever do it again in a really healthy way. So it took me a long time to adjust to this new life with a period and a really healthy balance and and decide whether competitive sport at the elite level had a place in this new life. And it did take some time and I didn't set long-term goals. I just took each season as it came and I'd get roped into my local league race cross country and I'd end up doing quite well. And then it would inspire me to carry on for a couple more months. And I would, um, qualify for a race for England and or Great Britain and I I would go and it'd be so inspiring and then I would be so motivated to show look you can compete at this level if you want to but you don't have to and I think so many of us when we're taking time out from our sport we just want to rush back to get to that level again and actually if that's not what makes you happy then you really don't need to so I really um, went through a big learning curve. And now, as I say, I just go with the flow. And I also enjoy other sports that I didn't allow myself time for before. So that's really fun, just cycling and swimming and and hiking. That's amazing. That's great to hear, Pippa. Well, um, this has been such a wonderful conversation to have with you. And about the work that you're doing now, but also just, of course, uh, one of my favorite things about this podcast is just female athletes sharing their experiences. And so thank you for going into detail about your past, as well as your, your present and what you're doing now with everything that your past experiences have kind of led up to. So we really appreciate you sharing your story with others. Where can people go to learn more and, and be a part of Project Red S? Yeah, well, luckily it's quite easy. It's www.red-s.com. I wish Red S didn't have a hyphen in it, a dash in it, but it does. So we've gone with that. And uh, hopefully you'll find something you need on there, whether you're an athlete, a coach, or someone who supports an athlete. It's got something for everyone, I hope. Yeah, absolutely. So Pippa, I end every podcast with fun questions. You ready to play? I'm ready. (laughs) If you could eat one food every day for the rest of your life and never get sick of it, what would it be? I think hummus. Wow. I love hummus. (laughs) Do you guys say hummus? I I say hummus. Oh, okay. Hummus. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Do you dabble with different flavors or? Mm, No, I like the organic hummus. I don't know if that's because it's not got anything artificial in it or not but I don't organic everything it's just hummus that I love yeah that's so funny yeah there's all here in the U.S. as far as store-bought hummus we have so many different flavors garlic red pepper chipotle but I actually like just the fl- the plain yeah that's my favorite you should try organic I don't know okay. it's a little bit more expensive but it has a flavor that the regular one doesn't so maybe try it I'll do it okay <laughs> That's awesome. So hummus every single day, you would never get sick of it. Yep. Pippa, what is your favorite sport to participate in yourself? Oh, I'd say cycling. I think cycling is the most fun sport because you can get the furthest and have the most adventures in a relatively short space of time. (laughs) I love that explanation. (laughs) (laughs) I love that explanation because it is funny. um, So many people... I I always have to, the walking, the running, the biking, it's like biking, you can go further running. You see a lot, a lot of people are like walking, you don't get anywhere, but I'm like, yeah, but you can like really take note of like flowers and you can see the bunnies and, you know, so there's benefits to them all, but cycling definitely takes you the furthest, the fastest. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) How about as a spectator, what's your favorite sport to watch from the sidelines? 
Mm, I would say horse riding. My um, my big sister is a professional ev- eventer. And so wow. I love watching her. But it's also quite terrifying because you're seeing her scale these enormous jumps and uh, your heart's in your mouth. But yeah, it's, it's fun mm. to watch. That's really cool. Awesome. And then Pippa, if there's a female athlete out there that you want to give a shout out to for being a role model and inspiration for any reason at all, who would that be and why? Oh, I'm going to say my best friend because I never give her shout outs and she so deserves one. But she is called Emily Todd and she's a British 800 meter runner who was really my mentor in the later stages of my Red S recovery. And we connected over so many experiences and she has been such a support to me over the years. And now she's a medical doctor and she is um, hopefully going to specialize in this so um, we can continue working together in the future. Excellent. Yeah. Well, shout out to Emily then and shout out to you, Pippa. Thank you so much for joining again and for for doing what you do. Thank you so much for having me and um, for doing what you do. Thank you. I really hope you enjoyed that episode and thanks for listening. But before I let you go, I have free resources that you can have access to right away, right now, so that you can start fueling your body as a fierce, fit, and fueled female athlete. First, I have your Red S recovery race. If you've ever wondered if you might be struggling with Red S, curious to learn more, or know you have Red S and are looking to recover fast, then you can head to www.riseupnutritionrun.com slash red S and download the red S recovery race. See how you place and figure out the next steps to recovery. Plus while there, I have a few other great resources for you, including three nutrition secrets that every elite athlete swears by and access to our private Facebook community, female athlete nutrition. So again, to gain access to all of this, head to riseupnutritionrun.com slash red S that's backslash R E D S. And you can gain access and get the help you need fast. Too many girls and women and female athletes struggle with nutrition, but you don't have to any longer become fierce, fit and fueled links in the show notes, and I'll see you next time.